America's Constitution and Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, are all based upon the Christian faith. All based upon the idea that all men are, and people are created equal, and that we all stand with equal status before our God. The founding fathers and mothers also took from Scripture the idea that we are free from our past, that grace has set us free, and because of what God has done for us through His Son, we are new creatures and can live the future in a new way. But I still have many discussions with many individuals, including Christians today, that ask me that if grace is free to all, then why cannot we just still abound in our sin? After all, God is going to forgive us, right? Well, the Apostle Paul addresses this very notion in his sixth chapter of his letter to the Romans. Apparently, those Christian, Roman Christians also had the same kind of questions for Paul and felt an obligation to dwell in their lives of sin because it was familiar and comfortable and it was what they wanted to do. And after all, we're free, right? But in this sixth chapter, Paul addresses all the more about our continuance in sin in order that grace may abound. And I'm picking up his thinking here in verse 12 of the 6th chapter and sharing with you his words from the 12th verse all the way through the end of the chapter. Let us share together the teachings of Holy Scripture. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having been slaves to sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were instructed, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present yourselves, your members, as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed. The end of those things is death. 
But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved God, the advantage you get is sanctification. And the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. In Jesus Christ our Lord. God, I've got the blessing to the reading of the word. One of the things that's always marveled me the most about the conflict we see between the Palestinians and the Jews over in the Middle East is that the cost always increases. If a Palestinian kills one Jew, then the Jews feel like they have to kill two Palestinians. Which means the Palestinians then have to kill three Jews. Which means the Jews then have to kill four Palestinians. And it just keeps increasing in animosity, in hatred, and in war. And this is such a good illustration of how we humans, individually, behave towards each other. There's the old American saying, you know, do me wrong once, shame on you, do me wrong twice, shame on me. Imagine if God took that attitude towards us. Just because grace is free to us, and cost Jesus a lot doesn't mean that we should then abound in our sins. Our Vacation Bible School this week's theme was Redemption Ranch. And we gave the kids three very clear illustrations of people that had done wrong who God redeemed. The first night was about the prisoner on the cross with Jesus who clearly was guilty of a crime, even he self-admitted it. But because he stood up for Jesus to the other criminal that was dangling from that cross, Jesus said to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. Day two was about a murderer that God chose to lead his people out of slavery. Moses. Now for you and I, if we knew Moses' background, we would really question his validity as our leader, would we not? Not God. And then the third day was about a guy named Saul who liked to take rocks and throw them at people like you and me because we proclaimed in Jesus Christ. And on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus to go persecute and stone to death more Christians, he had his life-altering, changing experience and became the greatest missionary in the history of human faith. But for the way today Americans judge people and predetermine people, we would have our problems with Saul, wouldn't we? But not God. But where it really got interesting with the kids was when it came down to a personal level. I said to the kids, yeah, I'm a minister for Jesus Christ. And what if I go out and go to the bar every night and go to the gambling place every night and walk over people's feelings and don't care about how they feel about it and treat people like dirt that's lower class than me. Would that be an example of Christianity? And they all very accurately said, no. It's important how we live as to how we witness to that faith. And how it 
any of us ever been turned on to Christianity had those Christian traits not been displayed to us through the lives, the words, and the deeds of the Christians that came before us. Sure, I could probably answer the theological question that you can probably sin all day long, seven, three hundred, sixty-five, whatever, and God probably would save you. I don't know. But my point to the kids was, what example are you setting for the others that you interact with? If you dwell in your sin and your own selfish, sinful ways, how does that display Christianity to the world? What if Paul did that? What if Billy Graham did that? What if Martin Luther King Jr. did that? Or Mother Teresa? Or the countless other saints who go, no, they understood that accepting God's grace meant living a different way. No longer presenting themselves and their members as slaves to sin, but presenting themselves and their members as slaves to righteousness. For sin has no dominion over us, since we are under the law, not under the law, but under grace. But since we are under grace, does that mean we should sin all the much more? The question is, who are we obedient to? Who are we enslaved to? For so many of us in the 21st century, we are enslaved to ourselves. We're about pursuing our own personal passions and pleasures and joys and gifts. And we really don't care about the other Americans that live around us. As long as we get what we want, we're good. It's not what Jesus did. And that's not what Jesus would do. I worry about the example that are given to these kids these days by adult Christians who pursue their own goals and their own desires and their own achievements and their own stuff over God. And that's who they become enslaved to. And Paul says, that's fine. That just leads to death. Or you can make the other choice and enslave yourself to righteousness and have eternal life. Did you notice this question or a sentence here? When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You see, when you're a slave to sin, you don't give a darn about righteousness. You can do whatever you want. Who cares, right? But when you are enslaved to God, you are truly free. Because now you don't have to worry about the pressures of this world. Now you don't have to worry about what others think about you because it only matters what God thinks about you. You don't have to worry about whether you're going to get your meal tomorrow or that your bills are going to be paid because God takes care of you if you're faithful to Him. I gave you three examples of such. But the ultimate one is right behind him. Who didn't care about himself, what he had for supper, whether he had air conditioning or shoes, as long as he was doing God's will for his life, God had him covered. 100%. And even when that meant a cross, it didn't scare him. The other part of this argument is, as one who tries my best to be enslaved to righteousness, I don't have to worry when I put my head on the pillow at night. But I know criminals that do. I know other people that really struggle with 
sleeping well and being at peace with themselves because they know the wrongs that they have done. And they're afraid it's all going to catch up with them. And it does. A life of righteousness is a life full of peace and contentment and joy and happiness because it knows that God is on their side. So what advantage does it give you then from the things in which you have done in your past from now which you are ashamed? The end of those things are death. And the past is what it is and not a single one of us can change what has happened in the past. But what we can do is change what is about to happen in our future. We can still be a slave to sin and make the same mistake over and over again, or we can be enslaved to righteousness, to the will of God for our lives, and find sanctification, which is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, one of the great things about freedom is that freedom gives you choices. You get the freedom to choose to work here or work there. To do this or to do that. To wear this or to wear something else. It's a great thing about freedom. And God gives us that freedom. He's not going to tell you how to live. He's going to allow you to make your own choices. And so starting today, you have a choice. You can continue in the wages of sin and experience its consequences. Or you can turn to the ways of God's Son and experience eternal life. It's your choice. It's your freedom. It's your decision. You have role models for you in both directions. All those who live their lives to pursue sin and wealth and greed and selfishness and pleasure. And you see the results of those lives. And then you also have the opposite examples. Some of the names who I've given you today. And the many other saints who dwelled on this planet that didn't live for themselves, but lived for God. Our invitation hymn today, written almost 100 years ago, expresses the same thought in this way. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not that my Lord was crucified, knowing not that it was for me that he died on Calvary. But there mercy was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied for me. There, my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. It is my hope and prayer that each and every Christian who proclaims Jesus Christ not only as their Savior, but as their Lord, their boss, finds liberty at Calvary. Let us stand.